see. All right. So hi, folks. I'm seeing that we have some people joining us um, in our um, in our attendee list. So we're going to give it a second as people kind of get get whooshed in by uh, the amazing technology <laughs> that is Zoom. Um, I want to encourage everybody um, before we get started, we're going to do some interpretation settings before I do um, much more. So I'm going to share a window. Um, and our, in, our Spanish language interpreters are going to share some important information with us. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Um, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you may be. Uh, so today's event will be conducted in English with Spanish interpretation and also ASL interpretation available. Anyone who is not Spanish Eng English bilingual will need to please select a language channel. To listen uh, to the interpretation on a computer, please locate the globe icon along the bottom row of your Zoom screen and select English. If you're joining via the Zoom app on a mobile device, click more or the three dots in the corner of your screen, select language interpretation, then choose English and click done. And do not select mute original audio, please. Hola, buenos días o buenas tardes. El evento de hoy se llevará a cabo en inglés con interpretación al español. También, como pueden ver, hay interpretación al idioma de lengua de señas estadounidense. Quien no sea bilingüe en inglés y español tendrá que, por favor, seleccionar un canal de interpretación. Para escuchar el español en la computadora, haga clic en el icono del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom y selecciona el idioma. Si se está conectando a través de la aplicación Zoom en un dispositivo móvil, haga clic en More o Más en los tres puntos puntos o en los tres puntos de la esquina de la pantalla. Seleccione Language Interpretation, que es la interpretación del idioma, elija su idioma y haga clic en Done. No seleccione, por favor, Mute Original Audio. Gracias. Thank you. Great. Thank you so very much. I am delighted to be here with you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click to hide our, um, well, actually, I'm going to leave my non-video participant showing um, I'm excited to have you here. Um, I am Chris Ash, and I'm the Survivor Leadership Program Manager at the National Survivor Network, which is a program of CAST. We are survivor-led. Our work is to empower meaningful survivor engagement um, by people who have lived experience of human trafficking, whether they really resonate with the framing or the label of survivor of trafficking or not. We try to help them have opportunities and change our movement so that they have more opportunities to engage as the thought leaders and the strategy leaders and the people moving things along in all movements to end violence, whether they do that work explicitly within the anti-trafficking sector or in other settings. Um, you can find out more about our work at the nationalsurvivornetwork.org where we have information about our values about our membership and we have some amazing resources there in our resource library that um, we're we're putting out there free of charge to try to um, strengthen what is happening in the movement. Uh, I do want to remind folks that NSN has a public health, human rights, and harm reduction approach to how we want to address human trafficking in all of its forms. Um, in the past, those are words that people really engage with and are excited about in the, um, the anti-trafficking movement. Um, and we don't have a lot of resources for how to do it in the context of ending trafficking and exploitation, right? It's, it's kind of alien to a lot of the frameworks that are common in anti-trafficking spaces. So um, I want to remind everyone that sometimes we lean really heavily into how we've always done things, right? We kind of, we, we use that how we've always done things and it ends up kind of limiting our imagination about what's out there. Um, and then we forget when we get stuck in how we've always done things as a sector, which is really invested in a lot of systems that impacted people have been coming up with solutions to take care of each other, to look out for each other, to solve their challenges that they're facing forever and that they haven't always done so using the standard anti-trafficking approach, right? So some of the ideas you hear today may sound radical <laughs> to, uh, 
to many of you. Some of, some of them sound radical to me and I'm still like, wow, what possibility? Like, um, you know, there's still ideas for like honoring people's agency. This is, this is really important to me personally. Um, so some of these ideas may sound radical. They may sound weird and that's okay. If there's something today you hear that feels confusing or maybe counterintuitive, or maybe it doesn't resonate with your personal experience, that's okay. Just take a pause, right? So you don't have to agree. We don't, all, we don't even, the panelists on this thing today probably don't even agree with every single thing that every other panelist says. And we're also still in dialogue. We're all still here learning. And so we're here to have our understanding of what harm reduction really means expanded um, so that we can think about what is possible when we um, can reimagine solutions in partnership with all people who've been impacted by both trafficking and trafficking policy. The other thing I want to acknowledge before we um, really get going is I know we have a lot of people in our webinar today, including on this panel, but as attendees who have lived experience of both commercial sex, um, sex trading, all different kinds, um, and also of being trafficked within commercial sex, whether it was as children or as um, youth or as adults, we know that a lot of us come here with experiences and that a lot of those experiences may be deeply traumatic and hard for us. And so that means that um, conversations like this are, are sometimes challenging emotionally and can kick up some of our triggers. So I wanna remind you, if you find yourself feeling overwhelmed or triggered to take care of yourself. And that may mean stepping away for a minute. It may mean that at some point you're ready to take a pause and come back and watch the recording later when you can do it in smaller chunks, take it at a pace that feels better for your nervous system. Um, yeah, so with that said, one of the things we've been digging a little deeper into in our work this year is prevention, really outlining what we mean by prevention and all the different ways prevention can happen. Um, if you go to our website and our resource library, you'll find that we put out a prevention document in January that really outlined an approach to ending exploitation, including human trafficking, with a focus on care, self-determination, and safety. And we think that those are three things that really align with a, a harm reduction approach. Um, we're working on a training in addition to those publications. I'm currently working on a training um, with a team of graduate students from the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health to work on developing trainings on prevention using that care, self-determination, and safety approach. It'll be available later this year, um, and we're very excited about all of that. So. With all of these, we draw heavily on a public health framework and we've integrated our commitment to anti-oppression and social justice and human rights throughout. Our panel today, we brought together um, people to really talk about what harm reduction means because I've seen some anti-trafficking orgs really be curious and maybe even start to implement some harm reduction practices without really shifting to an overall harm reduction approach. And our panel today, we're bringing together people who have experience, um, lived and professional experience, right? Um, one, the other, or both, who've been doing harm reduction, who know a lot about harm reduction and can bring y'all some of their on the ground learning and insights from the work that they are doing. So give me one moment, and I'm gonna launch a poll because we kind of wanna see where everyone is coming from. Start with poll one, give me a moment. And so our first poll is, what is your current level of familiarity with harm reduction? Shout out and props for your honesty to the one person so far who has responded, what is harm reduction even? <laughs> I, I love your honesty and come in here to learn, right? I love that. We all, we all are in different places. I'm still seeing some responses trickle in. 
All right, I'm going to share what we have. Here's kind of where we're looking at. We have the majority of you know a good bit, but are excited to learn more. We have a few of you who are experts. We have a, uh, a good number two who are on the learning end, like on, a, on an earlier place on the learning end of the spectrum. And that is fine. That is where we start and, and start our learning. So um, I'm going to launch our second poll just to give us an idea of where people are coming from. So how confident do you feel? Regardless of how much you think you know about it, how confident do you feel implementing a harm reduction approach in your work with people in the sex trades? I'm gonna give it a moment. I'm seeing that about half of us have replied. I'm just at 90%. Give it just one more second. What we're seeing here is that we have some who feel confident. We have a, a good number who are already implementing parts of it and feel good about it. But I'm seeing that we also have a lot of people, a good number here, I would say, almost half of our respondents are, are wanting to, but don't feel like they know enough yet, or they're anxious about even trying. So I'm so excited that you're here with us so that we can kind of hear what some of these practical responses and ways of, of doing this are. Um, I think what I'd love to do um, is just kind of kick us off with our panel and to get us started, I would love it if each of our panelists, if we could go around and you could each just introduce yourself and share a little bit about your, your experience doing harm reduction and using that philosophy in your work. And I see um, in my screen, the first one I see is Chibundo. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. If um, you're in a space that's afternoon right now. So my name is Chibundo Aguatu. I work at HIPS. Um, HIPS is a harm reduction agency in Washington, DC in Capitol Hill. Um, I work there as the coordinator of the advocacy department um, and also the sex worker advocates coalition coordinator. Um, my background in harm reduction is mostly at HIPS, but I've done work with, uh, of course, sex work, um, sex worker rights, sex work decrim stuff, um, anti jail building and um, anti bail stuff in Illinois and food justice slash um, farmers and workers rights work in the past. But yeah, that's me, thank you. Thank you. And next up in my screen, I see Cinnamon. As I pull my hair up in my screen. Hi everybody, my name is Cinnamon Love. I am a um, 30 year veteran sex worker. Uh, prior to that, I was an unhoused youth in the trade. Um, I also have experience being um, trafficked by a partner. Um, I am the current executive director and founder of the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Collective. We are based here in New York City. Um, uh, BIPOC Collective is a national um, organization providing direct services um, and education and um, a mental health and wellness, in, um, expanding mental health and wellness resources to um, black and brown sex workers um, in both the criminalized and legal forms of sex trade. Thank you. Next up, I see Emmy. Hi, this is Emmy Kama. I am I'm the coordinator of the Coalition for Rights and Safety for People in the Sex Trade. It is in Washington State and doing policy advocacy around criminalization. I'm also um, I also co-founded Eileen's, which is a community organizing and hospitality space for women who are working and on like out on the street on Pacific Highway in South King County, Washington State. And uh, I've been around um, doing harm reduction, sex work activism, and anti balance activism for like 20 years or more. Thank you, Emmy. And then um, finally, I, I have Rose. Thank you, Chris. My name is Rose Columba, and I'm a survivor of both sex and labor trafficking as a child. 
I'm also an Indigenous advocate for accessible well-being, and I work to fight against all forms of exploitation. After 11 years of grassroots organizing and advocacy work, I've seen so much proof of the power and harm reduction in our communities. My father, who is also a trafficking survivor, and I work on consulting to help organizations implement policies like this that are trauma-informed. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, all of you. So I'm thinking that um, given the fact that we um, are talking a good bit about commercial sex here, that now might be a good time to back up and just say, what do we mean when we say commercial sex? Because that's broad, right? It includes a lot of different things. And so Cinnamon, I was wondering if maybe you would start by just sharing a little bit about what do we mean when we talk about commercial sex? Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, when commercial sex is encompasses a wide umbrella of um, types of sexual labor um, that could be um, full service sex work or other kinds of touch related um, uh, labor, um, such as uh, including domination, um, uh, pro-domination, pro-subbing, it could be porn, um, escorting, dancing, camming, um, um, you know, body rubs. Um, and and also I think we should also, I wanna make sure that I'm, I mentioned the, that we're talking about both um, consensual sex work as well as um, people who are, um, who have been trafficked that, or fit the legal definition of um, having been trafficked as a minor. Um, so when we say commercial sex, we're referring to both consensual and um, non-consensual forms of labor. And I also think it's important to note that often people, um, and I know we'll talk about this later, but um, often people who are performing um, uh, commercial, working in commercial sex or, um, people, I have not had my ADD meds yet. So give me, bear with me for a second. Um, but, but when we're talking about people who are doing sexual labor, um, sometimes uh, folks don't necessarily consider it to be um, sex work or use that language. Um, some people due to either culture or um, or the type of labor that they're doing may not consider it to be, um, to be uh commercial at all it, or may not consider it to be sex work and so um and some people choose to use a language that other people may find offensive including um prostitution or um you know other language like that so i did want to just you know note that i know that there are some people you know i'm not sure how everyone on this call identifies i personally use the term sex work i know that there are others who don't use that term so when i'm refer as i'm speaking i will try to remember to use the term com commercial sex um but just know that you know it it's feel you know, it feels when i'm talking about myself i often use the term sex work so thank you Thanks, and I mean, I think that's important to highlight that different people may use different language that's comfortable um, and that, you know, even the choices we as the NSN make about how we talk about it reflect just the best consensus we can come to, but aren't like universal um, language. So, yeah, we um, we definitely use commercial sex because sometimes the things that trafficking victims need are the same things that sex workers need and saying the needs of people in commercial sex or the sex trades or you know, that's a way to kind of capture that some of those needs can be shared. Um, well, I know we chose the title of the panel discussion, Radical Non-Judgment at Emmy's Recommendation. That was an idea that Emmy put into the, the mix when we were planning and it just really landed well with a lot of us. So Emmy, do you wanna share what you mean by radical non-judgment? What does that mean to you? Yes, yeah, so stepping back, like there's one person who have no idea what harm reduction is and Thank you for your honesty again. But um, so harm reduction is the idea that really started um, in the drug user health um, community, especially during the AIDS, AIDS crisis, um, when people were getting infected through the sharing of needles, and then they started using you know needle exchange programs where you can provide um, clean syringes so that people don't have to share their their um, syringes with each other so that they can. Um, they can be healthy or they can, you know, they won't die from from AIDS and other 
um, infections that spread by sharing syringes. It started from that, but it's much bigger than that now. It's like I apply for everything. So, you know, when you have condom distribution, that's harm reduction. When you have housing, that doesn't, you know, doesn't require you to be quote clean sober and but allow you to move in and to have stability, that's harm reduction. So there are lots of like ways the harm reduction is, you know, spreading beyond simply just drug user health. And I do lots of work around survivor advocacy in domestic violence and sexual assault. So that, you know, when the when you know when the survivor advocacy have like, you know, at some point have told people like, oh, you have to report to the police because otherwise like the same person could be going around raping other people or something like that. And just really pressuring people to, you know, how they should um how they should act as a survivor, how they should heal, and all those things um, becomes really judgmental, and it takes away people's agency. So that you know, harm reduction is much more than just simply the you know drug user health. And so we're talking about doing harm reduction with people who are experiencing either the sex trafficking or people who are like vulnerable to trafficking, but you know, but can be advocated so that they have more power. And in that, it's really important that we think of harm reduction not simply as tactics, so that needle exchange is tactic, but the, there's like a philosophy and there's values that's much bigger than that, which, in, which is that, you know, we're not just telling people to stop using drugs. We're not telling people how they should live, but if they uh, want to, you know, live longer, live, be healthier, and uh, protect their lives, protect their community, um, then the, here are the tools that you can use to meet those goals. So we respect people's, you know, people's autonomy, people's self-determination, and respect um, like how they live and understanding that, of course, it would be really great if nobody ever used drugs and, you know, everything was fine, but that's not reality. It will be great if nobody was, you know, nobody had to um, engage in sex trade when they don't want to, but the reality is not there. People do whatever they do to survive under this economic system. So we, we approach that with non-judgment, trying to support whatever goals that people have for themselves and provide resources to enable that choice and really respecting people's autonomy and dignity in that process. Lots of times, um, you know, like organizations use harm reduction as a tactic without having the values that's to it. So they they say like, you know, okay, we don't kick you out for, for using drugs or drinking from our housing. But they say, well, because this is the better way to make you quit using drugs than, you know, being, you know, absolute about it. and okay, you're using the tactic of harm reduction, but you're not really having the value of non-judgment. You're not having the value of respecting people's autonomy and supporting their own goals as opposed to the service writer's goals or the government's goals of reducing certain things. So that's like a really difference between harm reduction as a tactic to harm reduction as value, which involves like radical non-judgment. So I hope that clarifies. Thank you. That does. Yeah. So what I what I really picked up from what you said is it's not us imposing what we think the solution is and then just using a gentler approach to get us there. <laughs> um, yeah, wonderful. So I know that one of the things and I mean, maybe you could start with this, but a lot of people worry that using a harm reduction approach, like I heard you mention people who are engaging in commercial sex who don't want to. Right. And we know that there are people who are in that position. Um, so a lot of people worry that using a harm reduction approach will leave someone who is engaging in commercial sex because they have limited options uh, because of their marginalizations, or maybe they're um, being trafficked, they're being actively trafficked, that if we do harm reduction, that they're left without options. I've even heard some people say that um, if we do harm reduction, that, um, you know, that then who will create the systems that help people get out of commercial sex if they don't want to be there. So can you speak a little bit to that and maybe even to why someone might want to use a harm reduction approach, even with someone who we know is being trafficked? Yeah, 
So I think that, you know, I mean, trafficking can mean different things, but what most often you see in terms of sex trafficking is not, it's not the Hollywood version of like, you know, kidnapping and people putting chains and things like that. That's not, you know, reality for sex trafficking. For the most part, of course, there are cases where that can happen. And th that may require a different kind of response. But lots of times, what it looks like is ordinary domestic violence or labor exploitation practices. So when people have leverage over somebody because of their power, because of their, you know, because of the vulnerability, whether they're social or emotional or otherwise, and that they're in this relationship that's controlling, that's abusive, that's exploitative, we want to do something about it. And we have learned lessons from the domestic violence movement. You can't just tell a survivor to leave. That doesn't, doesn't work. You can't just call the police and have them handle it because that doesn't that also doesn't work. Now, we need to create resources so people can leave if they want to leave. But what's most important is to have a relationship with people so that they are able to access those resources when they need it. And so there are different, you know, ways that the mis violence movement has uh, used, uh, you know, the, you know, doing the harm, doing the safety planning, doing otherwise, and doing, you know, relationship building so that you can get trust of the person who's exploit, exp experiencing abuse, and one day, like if they, when they want to, when they choose, they can access those resources to help to for help, and, but you know, like. I think like lots of times, like non-harm reduction approaches, which is calling the police and all that, that, those destroy relationships. So the social service providers are not trusted because they call the police or they work with the police. And as a result, you don't end up developing those relationships that are really needed in advocating for survivors, whether it's domestic violence or sexual, you know, sex trafficking or otherwise. And so that's the, you know, and, and, and the creating resources is also really important so that, you know, needle exchange doesn't happen if we just say that, you know, oh, yeah, everybody should be able to do whatever they want. You, you, somebody actually has to fund resources to provide needle exchange. Somebody has to provide resources for the substance use treatment if that's what people want. Somebody has to provide housing. So those work are still needed. Um, like when you do condom distribution or when you do like, you know, um, comprehensive sex education and you're not, you know, telling people to go have sex. You are, you know, of course, abstinence is an option. Leaving sex trade is an option. You know, getting help and getting away from the abusive relationship is an option. But that really needs to be, you know, the person's choice. And it has to be, you know, their autonomy is respected and built up through those trusting relationships. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that was definitely helpful. Um, Rose, I know when we were planning for this panel, you shared something about this that stood out to me. And I was wondering if you would share the analogy that you shared during our planning session. Thank you so much, Chris. So um, to kind of uh, warm up to that a little bit, I wanted to speak some more on how many of the problems with organizations or individual care service providers that are not implementing radical non-judgmental harm reduction policies. Sorry, that was a mouthful of a source. <laughs> um, is they often end up seeking to rescue someone from a situation. While their situation may not be ideal, it also may be the best option they have right now. And it's important to respect their agency, especially because many of us have already had our agency violated at least once before, probably more. Um, they very well may be in even more danger if they're removed from their situation, the person who they're trying to rescue, especially if they're not given any better options or long-term wraparound care services that are non-judgmental. Imagine someone's home is deemed to need work done on it before it's ideal to live in. Maybe their roof is leaking a lot, for example, so it's not good, um, or there's black mold, you know, something that's not great, but not like, okay, you need to evacuate immediately. You wouldn't go demolish their home because of that, right? And then pat yourself on the back for saving them and walk away, leaving them to stand in a pile of rubble, wondering what to do next. I mean, I would certainly hope not. Another thing is that organizations and policies have begun to pop up that appropriate the language of harm reduction, but actually just often perpetuate more harm. For example, the Nordic model is often presented as a harm reduction as compromise to keep workers safe, but that's not what happens in reality. Under the Nordic model, engaging in sex work as a worker is technically legal on paper, <clears throat> but not really. 
Every other aspect of a sex worker's existence and relationships are scrutinized and criminalized. Under this model, friends and family who do things like be roommates with or give a ride to a sex worker, pretty normal things, right? Can be charged with pimping or brothel keeping related charges. All this does is further isolate socially an already marginalized population, which further creates an environment that allows violence to thrive. Much like how domestic abusers often intentionally isolate us from our support networks. Another thing to keep in mind is that to traffickers tend not to care about the law and that trafficking is still illegal under full decriminalization of sex work. Sex work and sex trafficking are two entirely different things and those who conflate the two do harm in many ways. I've only just begun to touch on here. The best way to make sure no one is doing sex work who doesn't 100% enthusiastically want to isn't by criminalizing. It's by giving us money, resources, housing, childcare, and other resources. Taking away someone's income and other resources is like the analogy I made above about demolishing someone's home, or earlier, sorry. <laughs> Doing that and then saying, I just saved you, you're welcome, is inherently paradoxical. As someone navigating poverty and multiple disabilities and chronic illnesses myself for most of my life, including the present, and also trying to just simply survive under colonization and capitalism, it does not help me to take away more of my already limited options. And truthfully, so-called anti-trafficking organizations that are actually just anti-sex work have exploited me and so many other survivors tremendously. So it's very problematic that most civvies get their info on sex work from organizations like this. The bottom line is taking away someone's choices and then isolating them socially is not conducive to a healthy individual or community. And the people who oppress our communities know this, which is why it's encouraged. This applies to so many other aspects of harm reduction too, like Emmy mentioned regarding drug use. For example, in many of our indigenous communities, relatives who are using drugs are often required to be abstinent for a certain amount of time before going to ceremony. Emma Allen from Native Youth Sexual Health Network talks about how it's harm reduction to allow relatives to send, attend ceremony, whether or not they're currently using, and I fully agree. I want to end with this quote from Shira Hassan's Saving Our Own Lives book about the importance of harm reduction. Those of us who do not survive whisper the secrets of how to be safer to the next generation through cherished platforms like handwritten instructional zines and song, protest chants, and the stories our communities share through our visceral histories. Thank you. Sorry for my throat acting up a little. Thank you all for your patience. Thank you, Rose. Thank, Thank you. Did anyone else have anything you wanted to add on that one point about the idea of using harm reduction with people who are either being trafficked or maybe don't want to be in commercial sex? Um, I'd love to hop in. Um, I really love Emmy's analogy to um, domestic violence um, because we often, especially with folks who don't necessarily see themselves as being trafficked, um, but are experiencing financial, emotional, or physical abuse within their relationships, um, you know, it's, I think that we often don't think about the ways in which trying to get people help can further criminalize them. And, you know, it, it's so important to remember that, you know, especially when there are children involved, that often calling the police for, you know, for a domestic violence situation can often, you know, further criminalize the survivor by um, getting them wrapped up in family and children's services. Um, you know, I think people don't, a lot of people I don't think understand um, what that looks like, but, you know, if children are witness to domestic violence that is considered to be child abuse and can have children removed from, um, from their homes and further cause violence in those situations as well. And not to say that we don't want to help people, but to recognize the ways that our current systems do criminalize people um, under the guise of helping them. I think that it makes, it makes a lot more sense to take a step back before allowing you know, our knee-jerk reactions to um, to guide the ways in which we, you know, propose to help people. Um, and, and so I just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks for naming that. I know that a lot of our um, members in the NSN have been engaged um, in child protective issues um, due to their trafficking or commercial sex engagement, um, even during times when they were doing the best they could and, you know, that can add a whole lot of complications and also coercion that can add coercion when now your trafficker has that to hold over your head. Um, 
I think one of the other things I've heard is um, some talk that frames harm reduction as if it's in opposition to structural change, right? You're just teaching people how to survive oppressive systems and instead we should be changing structural oppression and addressing that. It like, it keeps us from addressing structural oppression. It's in opposition. Um, Chibundo, would you wanna share a little about like your thoughts on that? How, how you see harm reduction and anti-oppression work? Yeah. Really? Yeah, of course. Um, I think the quote from the Black Panther Party is survival pending revolution. So even when it comes to this discussion about changing systems, the people we want to be alive to do that need to be alive to do that. So it's it's just a very strange thing <laughs> to ask someone to not survive because their lives aren't because they're being marginalized. Basically, I, I, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't compute <laughs> in the harm reductionist framework at all. Um, I think also um, oh goodness, I had another point. Oof. Oh yeah, it's just like in general, I know that folks are using a lot of analogies to help people think about that for themselves, especially Rose's um, house analogy is really good of how bad would your house need to be before you feel like someone should be able to demolish it without your consent. <laughs> and that's basically the same thing here is how, un, how bad of a world do you need to be born in and to be thrown in before you feel like someone can make decisions for you without asking you and before you think someone should care less about your survival and more about how bad the systems are like what what poor system costs your life in your opinion would you be okay with and why would you ask anyone else to give up their lives um because a system is bad you no know, people deserve to be able to survive um i think uh emmy was talking about how of course ideally no one would ever want to have to use this harmful substance or do a harmful behavior but that's just not true um, but we do know that those harms can be reduced. So instead of saying, unless you like never, ever, ever do something that could have risks to it ever, what, <laughs> question mark? And also, of course, even right now, there are plenty of people who say they're doing systems change and systems work. And I don't believe that people not surviving has to be a part of that strategy. I'm No one yet has liberated everybody. So I don't think anyone has the, you know, the, what would you even call that? The credentials to tell us how to do it. Um, but as someone who likes living at this moment in time, I would love if my survival is part of someone's plan to save me. <laughs> um, I would. That sounded really, really bitter. I didn't mean it for this to be so bitter, but thank you for the question and apologies for my, my negative <laughs> tone in my answer. <laughs> I think it's actually, I mean, like there's sometimes when when that's the only appropriate response. And when you said that, I noticed in my own body having like an entire shift of being like, yeah, I don't think I'm willing to sacrifice you or any of our panelists or anyone in the name of some ideal that we're not living in right now, you know? Um, yeah, which kind of reminds me that because you mentioned like access to options, marginalization, um, the systems that we're in, thinking about that, I know that harm reduction isn't a set of practices where it's a one size fits all approach that we have to have an intersectional lens because even among people who have uh, lots of different um, identities or experiences that have led them to be marginalized from our society and from its access to safety and resources and structural power, there's still difference, um, different experiences of that. And so, can someone maybe share some examples of harm reduction principles being used in different contexts based on someone's culture, or identities, or specific community needs? I know, um, Chibundo, I had you down as someone who had some thoughts, but I also think that everybody had thoughts on this one. <laughs> I can let you start. Yeah, which is ideal, because like that's why we're all on this panel, because we have thoughts to share. <laughs> um, so just uh, working in the Sex Worker Advocates Coalition here in DC, um, with HIPS. One thing we talked about a lot is that, um, as Emmy pointed out, harm reduction did start from the HIV AIDS moment. Um, I said moment because it's not over. <laughs> I hate saying crisis because it sounds like that ended at some point in time, but at least in DC, it definitely didn't end. Um, but yeah, um, how discussions about needles and drug use um, were was the progenitor of a lot of discussions about harm reduction. But of course, sex work was kind of always do, 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 right there with it um, because of 
condom distributions and um, discussions about like lube as harm reduction and all these other nuanced conversations. Um, but yeah, while we are talking about harm reduction, especially when we're talking about it for sex workers, we think of methods that would be more useful for sex workers than the set of practices some people believe harm reduction is. Um, as we've been talking about, harm reduction is a philosophy, not just um, you know a certain lexicon of practices. Um, so one of the things we did mention was like for someone who's working on the street, it might be really nice if they had just better pictures so that they could feel more confident charging more. Um, it might be really great for them to have their own website so they don't have to use the advertising or rely on advertising as much. It might be great if we could have a little pool of folks who are willing to support sex workers, do some donations so they can buy decent ads if they want to buy decent ads. It allows them to charge more for um, the same amount of time uh, working, which is great because of course, if they are able to charge more and get more, then they are able to work less. And we know that when it comes to sex work and harm reduction, the harm is clients and residents and cops and anything that can give them an access to these people to think they can hurt folks with impunity. Um, so anything that makes them able to have fewer interactions and also survive is what we think of harm as harm reduction. And I know that can be difficult for folks where they want to do harm reduction for sex workers by giving them condoms, but the idea of helping them professionalize as a sex worker feels too far. You know, <laughs> the idea of helping them make more money feels too far. So I think a lot of, um, I guess, starting with our own lenses of what harm reduction can be as a philosophy for the folks we're thinking about means, of course, immediately like kind of decolonizing your own mind. Like it has to start there of like, what do you think people deserve? Um, if someone's doing something that you do not agree with, how hard would you work to make sure that they can't do something you do like you don't agree with you feel me like even you have access to photographers you might have access to people who'd be willing to pay for someone to have a better ad or something like that but you won't do it that's a you thing that's doesn't really have anything to do with anybody else so yeah my answer to the question is those examples about um, harm reduction for sex workers how it looks different or it could look different and of course how um cultural competency with harm reduction means at first challenging the like the cop in your own mind <laughs> that's not willing to let some people live mm -hmm. and I'm thinking as I hear you say that that I can I can imagine as you, I'm glad you named that that can be really hard for people to wrap their minds around um that, that kind of example uh because a lot of times we're taught at least in the anti-trafficking movement that it's someone who's not otherwise going to be engaging in sex work like we're not going to someone who's never done sex work, not interested in doing sex work and saying, hey, guys, want us to buy you a website and some photographers to start your own business? This right. This isn't like an on or off switch. This is actually looking at people's real life options and trade offs and how we can support them to make the choices that they want to make. And I love how the example that you said highlighted that. Does okay. anyone else have something you wanted to add? Oh, go ahead. I wanted to uh, round it out a little bit. So as you're saying, these are folks who might already be engaging in these behaviors and in these spaces. So having a better picture is really helpful for someone who might be taking um, really cruddy pictures with like a burner phone, like flip phone that they have. You know, um, someone's like, oh, you're probably poor. And that means I could probably do whatever I want to you. Um, if somebody doesn't understand like a, doesn't have a lot of tech literacy, doesn't have a website or any social, like any presence online, maybe it's harder for them to even get regulars. So they have to constantly have new interactions with new people who might hurt them. Um, and of course, I think the last one I had was the ads. So if someone doesn't, can afford ads, maybe they're only on websites where you could advertise for free and maybe not even uh, in a way that's not like the cops aren't scanning for it. Um, and that, and they also might be able to um, just have their ads go out, reach more people. Um, so as I was saying before, it's just less labor on their end, less work, less interactions, and maybe even better screening possibilities. I'm not one of those people who believes that clients who pay more um, are less dangerous. I think that's really classist and racist, but um, you know, we don't have to get into that right now. That's not the purpose of this. I just wanted to show people why websites might be helpful and why 
better images might be helpful because they're already doing these things. Thank you. Does anyone else have something you want to share, some examples? Yeah, I, I would love to. Um, you know, I I love this this, you know, the these suggestions that Chipunda Chipundo has um yeah ha, um gave because I um you know one of the things that we did um in our year one statistics one of the things we found in our year one statistics was that um 61% of the people seeking financial assistance from BIPOC Collective were already involved in doing both criminalized and legal forms of work. And so being able to make sure that people have you know, access to technology, particularly if they're unhoused or particularly if they have, you know, like, you know, un, um, it, it, particularly if they don't have, you know, regular and stable housing, making sure that they do have some sort, you know, technology, not only in terms of like laptops or iPads, but also like portable Wi-Fi so that they can get online. I think that, you know, for, you know, making sure that they understand, have a have a rudimentary understanding of like cybersecurity so that they can protect themselves in their location, um, in their, you know, when they are taking photos or videos of themselves and uploading them online so that they can reduce Reduce the possibility of stalking is really important as well, um, and and keep, you know keeping in mind that you know for people who are willing to work online, whether they are face forward or not, because many um, online workers are are not face forward these days, whereas you know twenty years ago that was not the case. Um, but for people who do choose to work online in some of the legal forms of, of sex work, having those 1099s um, at the end of every year to be able to file taxes um, opens up the possibility for things like government housing, for apartments. Um, you know, even here in New York City, even to apply for a lottery apartment, you still have to have tax returns and 1099s. Um, to be able to be eligible for work. And so for people who are willing and interested in doing online labor, you know, having that kind of access to be able to prove where their income is coming from, even if they're not earning a lot of money, it does open up the possibility for them to be able to have, to, to gain access to those kinds of resources. Um, also working with folks to identify any gaps in their, um, um, in their, um, in their credit reports that might be prohibiting them from being able to access housing. I mean, you know, it's really a shame the way that our um, that our housing industry is really determinant on whether or not you um, are able to not only earn a living, but pay your bills on time <laughs> is really amazing to me. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I believe that housing should not be a for-profit industry, but that's just me. Um, but because it is like identifying for folks whether or not they have those kinds of gaps that need to be um, that need to be resolved, um, and helping them to figure out how to go about doing that, um, if is is you know also reduces that barrier. And 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 on that subject too, for um, people who are incarcerated, um, you know, keeping in mind that you know, there's someone I know had created a, um, they were working on a project through Blue Ridge here in New York, um, that didn't make any movement, but it's something to, that gave me a lot to think about. Um, they recognize that if you are incarcerated for like seven years or longer, your credit score completely disappears. And so you don't, and, and that, uh, that really traps people in a cycle of living in shelters and living in halfway houses and not being able to um, get into housing because when they come out, they don't have a credit score to be able to, to get into housing. So, um, you know, we're doing, um, giving people like micro loans of like even a dollar that that then gets repaid out of their commissary so that you can report this loan this micro loan as um, having been paid off and boosting their credit score while they're incarcerated allows them to come out with a credit score that can enable them to be able to actually get into housing and reduce the time that they've spent in, that they might spend otherwise in um, in the shelter system. 
Um, and then something else that I was thinking about as well, you know, in terms of, you know, we talked a lot about needle exchange, but um, but also I think that we should, you know, keep in mind that not all um, substance users are, you know, utilizing needles, making sure that we're also, you know, equipping people with Narcan and with fentanyl test strips, especially these days, because fentanyl is being used so much in, um, in the emergency room settings for pain, they're being it's being used a lot in our, um, you know, for short term surgeries. And then, you know, and also you know, we're finding that it's being used to cut things like um, cocaine and um, and Molly also. And so the the possibility of people gaining access to, um, you know, to certain substances that may be um, tainted with fentanyl and giving arming them with the ways that, you know, with the necessary tools to be able to test um, those substances as, you know, to reduce harm and also the necessary tools to be able to reverse a potential overdose. And, and, and I also think about it, but because we've been talking a lot about, um, you know, other types of sexual labor, you know, I, you know, I don't think we talk enough about teaching people about, you know, things that are really vital to our work, like making sure that the, their clients don't have latex allergies before putting them into a latex body bag and having a potential, you know, um, someone potentially having anaphylaxis. And I think that like, you know, thinking about these kinds of, um, of, of, um, ways in which they could be potentially, um, uh, criminalized if there is some sort of a, um, you know, if there's something that happens not only to themselves, but also to other people that they're working with, um, can, can ultimately reduce harm in the long run as well. Yeah, I know it's kind of getting long, but I just want to add, there's so many things I want to add. I really appreciate like all the ideas. Um, first, like, um, I'm, I'm part of a project trying to open up like a, this, um, this like a cam space where people can come and like learn how to do camming work. And there, we talked to lots of people who work in the street and they're interested in doing the cam work, but they don't know where to begin. They don't know what they need, all that, you know, how to, how to sign up and all that. So we can like, you know, like a space where people who are already doing it can show them what to do and how to do it. And then, you know, and it's a free space people can come and use. And then if they really think like this is something that they can do, then we'll try to help people um, like get their, their own equipment and all that and set up and all that. So like that's kind of space that we're trying to build and that's really good. And also like, you know, um, what the cinnamon was saying about like a different, you know, drug use. Um, in, in this area, I think people are just like smoking pills so much these days that there are so like much fewer need for um, syringes. And even though, you know, people still need syringes, but like, and then there are other equipments you can actually distribute, like, you know, pipes. So we can, you know, we are really popular when we have like pipes to people, people just like flock to it. And also like, you know, people using aluminum foil to um, smoke something, but it doesn't, like many of the foils have like toxic things on it and they're a specific kind of like a foil that's not you know that doesn't have a coating that's toxic to people and and distributing those things would be really great but I think like many of you actually work at agencies and agency culture is so important so that people don't feel like they have to hide part of like you know what they do how they live how they you know how they you know support their family and all that I feel like lots of people feel like they have to hide or if they admit to engage in sex trade, they have to mold their stories into, you know, being a victim. And well, I have to do it because of this circumstance, there's a bit, you know, all that. And lots of people who come to like the my organization are people who felt like really alienated from other organizations because they assume that you know, nobody would ever do this unless like you absolutely have to or you're forced to, and therefore um, you're a victim. And that if you admit to anything else, if your story doesn't match up with the agency expectation, then they feel like they have to hide it and they have to play along with whatever stories they have. So, you know, having the agency to actually commit to the value of non-judgment 
is really important. And um, individually, of course, you can believe whatever you want. And, you know, you can believe that, you know, in an ideal world, there's no sex work or sex trade. And that's one way you can believe. Or another person might believe that in an ideal world, everybody who is doing sex trade are, you know, doing it willingly. And uh, because that's the better better work than anything else. And so people can have different ideas about what the ideal world is. And the fact is that we don't live in an ideal world. And and everybody has, you know, to decide how they will fit into this world and how they'll survive. And that having this like non-judgment as as an organizational and agency culture is really important so that you don't push away people who are needing services. I know Rose had something that she wanted to add. Thank you. This discussion is so good, but I know Rose had something to add. Thank you so much. Um, one thing I was thinking is as simple as it sounds, sometimes just asking people what they need in the moment is best because um, especially in the West, there tends to be this kind of like, you know, Western lens kind of like whatever is currently popular and like, you know, the car serial like kind of policies or the medical complex Um it's kind of forced onto survivors, whether that's in an emergency room setting or when they're seeking help or resources of any kind, um, survivors or just pop marginalized populations in general. And um, the best thing to do is to genuinely ask someone what they want and need and be willing to listen, even if it doesn't sound like what you think you would want or need in the same situation. Thank you. And I Thank know um, just to give our panelists a head up, heads up, I'm going to move the question we had next closer to the end because we've already kind of started digging into um, one of our other questions, which is thinking of specifics with agencies and organizations. Um, I know some of us are doing policy work in anti-trafficking spaces, but a lot of people on this call are doing um, direct services. I know as I'm hearing you talk, I'm thinking of a lot of the anti-trafficking policies that are focused on things like removing sex workers' access to um, banking or online platforms. And I'm just really seeing how that can have some harmful impacts on people who are trying to build safety and stability. But in terms of direct services, shelters, case management, therapy, support groups, can maybe you give us some ideas of how people might implement a harm reduction philosophy in giving those kinds of services on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, not really thinking of like your, your harm reduction outreach org, but just thinking an anti-trafficking agency where we know we're working with people who are being, there's the beagle. I knew she would help me cope against my will. Um, but thinking of anti-trafficking orgs, how might they bring that harm reduction philosophy into the kinds of services they provide? or maybe even a domestic violence or sexual violence word, right? I have a, I have a great one. And um, I, you know, it has been my experience that so many like uh, shelters, whether it's for domestic violence or whether it is just, you know, for, you know, un for unhoused people in general, always implement curfews and, it's, you know, when it's specifically when we're thinking about our population, um, you know, people often work at night or they work the most at night and being able to access shelter after eight o'clock or after six o'clock, you know, is really important. People shouldn't be restricted in terms of when they can come and go from, you know, from a shelter in, you know, and also expect, you know, be expected to work, um, you know, or, you know, as well. And so I think that getting rid of, of curfews for shelters, I mean, we're talking about you know, primarily adults here, um, you know, having a, having that, those kinds of restrictions for people around what time they come in is, um, is, is paternalistic and should not exist first and foremost. Um, and then I've just lost my second thought. So I'll come back to it and let someone else go. Anyone else? Just kind of seconding what Cinnamon said, like when you put so many conditions and stipulations on people accessing resources and shelter, it just, a lot of people who are already exhausted are just not going to even bother. And then that, you know, where does that leave us? Yeah, I think that, you know, 
we need to have non-judgmental and not means tested so that people don't have to go through hoops to try to prove that they deserve help, they deserve resources. And also like I, I you know, I'm in Seattle, there are local um, anti-trafficking organization that's like, you know, helping people build, rebuild their careers. But what they're doing is putting people in Amazon warehouse and Amazon warehouse is not sustainable workplace. You cannot work there, you know, as a career because of the how much it breaks your body and you know spirit the way that you know they think that sex trade does to people but actually amazon warehouse is not also not like it, it's a short-term job for many most people who work right and so there's like a you know there's a disconnect between like you know what are we really valuing are we valuing the people have and like you know, life and work that's sustainable and healthy for people, or is it you know are we just trying to stop sex trade from happening, right? And that's again like that goes back to the agency culture and organizations that you know are really committed to supporting people where they are at and with within the you know the we we know that even you know in the domestic violence assault situations that. And we don't, you know, tell people that, oh, if you didn't leave, then that then you consented to being abused. Or if you didn't like fight back, then you consented to being raped. And that's not the case. And and similarly, like people in sex trade make decisions all the time. Even people who are legally classified as being sex trafficked also make choices in their lives, maybe staying with abusive person who is taking advantage of you, things like that. that's also not consent to being abused, but while exercising agency in some way, right? So that, you know, really having complicated understanding of that, you know, how people are making decisions under different combination of a choice and circumstances and coercion that are all operating in our, our our experiences and and recognizing that even in those circumstances there are people making some kind of you know choices and having agency in it and respecting it has to be like a core of the organizational culture and so that the people don't feel like that they have to be you know one or the other or like you know they have to be either you are a completely powerless trafficked victim, or you are completely, you know, empowered a sex worker who have all the choices in the world, which is not, you know, it's not realistic to think of that that way, right? So the service design really need to be, you know, rethought and to so that it can deliver people things that they need without like trying to push people into a certain way of living, right? Thank you. That's got me thinking a little bit about like, so maybe there's, it sounds like there's already harm reduction organizations that out that are out there. And I have heard from people doing sex worker harm reduction that what they do not want is for anti-trafficking advocates to think that now they're going to go start doing harm reduction if they really haven't unpacked some of these systems things, right? That we want to build partnerships with people who are already doing harm reduction. We want to show solidarity. So um, and I was can wondering. I, can if I also add one more thing, though? Sure. And one more thing is that, and um, I see that like, you know many many survivors are being like being like used by anti-trafficking organizations that you know to promote their messages, such as like you know we need to get rid of the back page or you know you know back get rid of Pornhub and all those you know websites and that sex workers used to survive. I mean, Pornhub is a different creature. It's, you know, nobody really likes them. <laughs> but, but, um, but like, you know, still, like, some people actually get money. More often, they're being exploited and being, their image is stolen and stuff, but that aside. And, uh, you know, survivors are being used to promote certain messages. But when they stray away from their orthodoxy, that they get really pushed out out and so that often the survivors like you know they get paid not very much but they get paid some money to be their spokesperson and then that you know put them in this circumstance where their livelihood depends on um, you know going along with this anti-sex trade line 
um, in, in public and telling their stories over and over. And I was actually reading like the, the, the autobiography of the Frederick Douglass and how he was talking about how when he started talking, you know, giving testimonies and speaking about his own experience of slavery, um, everybody wanted to hear about that experience. And then after a few months, he started talking about his analysis and what policies we should push for, what the what the you know United States should do, and all that. Then suddenly people started telling them, "Oh, stick to the facts, stick to your story about slavery. We don't want to hear your opinion. We will do that." This is like a white abolitionist telling. Frederick Douglass that they don't want to hear about what he actually thinks about, you know, slavery or about the politics. They just want to use him and pull his story. And he writes about this in his book, <laughs> like, you know, and I think there's something really similar is happening. People are being used for their stories and, and, and yet they're not really valued for who they are and what they really think. And that they get, they get like, you know, financially dependent on playing this role and that really needs to change. So I think that the National Survivor Network is really valuable because we can, you know, you don't have to, you know, limit that in what we say, right? Thank you. And I will say, I just want to add based on what you were saying about those spaces, a lot of our members are those people who've been exploited um, by other anti-trafficking orgs or are people who've been made to feel like their ideas don't count because they're not saying the right thing and it's easy for us to talk about that as if it's an intellectual exercise but we've literally had members who at their first meetings have cried um, as people who support sex worker safety and our survivors and have said I didn't think there was a space like this for me in this movement um, and so I, I really think the trafficking sector has to come to terms with that dynamic and with understanding harm reduction um, so we can have less of marginalizing survivors from their own sector, the, the sector that says it's there for them. <laughs> but that, then it also, again, that kind of circles us back around to solidarity, like how can anti-trafficking orgs who want to show support do that? How can we support as anti-trafficking organizations harm reduction? organizations. Sorry, I was, <laughs> I, this is, this quote got me excited. So I was just like, there's a Fannie Lou Hamer quote that reminds me of, I started going down the rabbit hole, my bad y'all. Um, so as far as what anti-trafficking organizations can do to support harm reduction agents, I, I, agencies, or did I say organizations? Organizations, yeah. Um, one of the things that I've thought about is, um, the fact that it's hard to fund harm reduction. Um, Emmy's talked about this, um, especially when you're trying to create systems of care that exist outside of a carceral state. It's, who's funding that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> who's going to fund that? You know. Um, so one thing that anti-trafficking organizations have is not just money, but fiscal respectability whether or not they're actually doing fiscally respectable work. We don't have to go there, but we know we've all experienced some organizations with a respectable vibe because <laughs> of the work they say they do who are doing things that are really wild. So with the fiscal resp respectability that you have as an anti-trafficking organization, you could be a fiscal sponsor. You could fiscally sponsor a harm reduction project. Um, I did see a, a question in the Q&A about how to make sure um, you're supporting folks. Of course, I, I could answer that more specifically once the Q&A section happens because I don't want to get too deep into it. But um, one thing that can help kind of avoid um, undue scrutiny from you know the police is working with an organization that doesn't have that undue scrutiny. <laughs> and as we all know, there are plenty of anti-trafficking organizations, some very small, some faith-based, some secular in middle America, on the coast, everywhere and anywhere that, you know, it's, it's a broad field um, and there's a lot of colors going on there um, and not everyone's doing the same type of work. So, but anyways, so fiscally sponsoring a project, helping them with capacity, um, helping them just have a bank account. Um, Cause if you're working with sex workers, especially helping sex workers in ways that they say they need, you know, like something like having a better pictures or 
as Emmy's talking about having um, like a, a studio space and skill building to make sure they can make content. Yeah, you might have some undue scrutiny from tax authorities, police, and, um, you know, local legislators, local policy folks, um, especially in, like, I'm from Florida, where um, we see that a lot, where you're doing something a little that pushes a couple boundaries on um, how we feel about certain marginalized groups. And you'll have local politicians decide to collude with all these other parties to like make bills <laughs> against the work that you're doing and things like that. So we're used to a pretty aggressive space, but yeah, fiscally sponsoring, helping with capacity support. If you have lawyers and policy people on your team, help out a harm reduction agency with those folks. Um, if you are living in a place with bail, helping um, when some arrests happen of some folks' clients, they should be able to call you and be like, I know this organization can help me out. I know this organization can help us out with lawyers. I know this organization can help us out with a, a clean um, bank account. You know, I know this organization can help us with volunteers <laughs> or with um, uh, accountants for our own accounting or help us with skill building, help us with fiscal literacy. Like there's so many resources that um, folks at anti-trafficking organizations have that, you know, even folks who are running the the harm reduction organizations may not have. So, yeah. And, and I just want to add to that, that the one thing that harm, that um, the one resource that, uh, that harm reduction agencies really need is money. And, you know, for folks at these, at anti-trafficking organizations who are receiving all of this money to be able to re-grant that, you know, some of that money, particularly around things like healthcare, um, you know, a, a, you know, a lot of agencies are, you know, harm reduction agencies are healthcare agencies, right? And so, you know, if if someone wanted to, you know, our organization, for example, is running a one to one therapy fund, and we are taking money that we got from a grant to be able and paying for people's sex work friendly therapists um, at sex worker led organizations. And so, you know, if, uh, if other organizations, if human trafficking organizations want to give us money to be able to fund more sex workers gaining access to quality, you know, to compassionate care, care, then that helps, you know, that helps a larger number of sex workers who may not ever walk through the doors of an, of an anti-trafficking organization because they don't see themselves as having been trafficked. And it's not that, you know, things like that for whether it's through our organization or others, there are tons and tons of sex worker led organizations that need funding that we won't get, but that your organizations are. And, you know, ultimately that money should be getting, you know, regranted to or to sex workers who, to be able to help our own communities as opposed to you all trying to do you know other people trying to do it for us no no one of the things as I'm hearing you talk about like resources that it's hard to get access to um I'm also thinking about systems and how many systems gaps there are that leave people really vulnerable I know even though NSN is not a direct service agency, I regularly hear from people who are in crisis who are looking out for support because sometimes when you're in that really hard place, you reach out to anyone. Like you don't even, you just are hoping someone will respond. And I know doing harm reduction and this kind of work can take its toll on us because, um, you know, sometimes there's just not services. There's not enough services and funding for the things that we know that people need. And that's heartbreaking can also be hard sometimes if we think someone, you know, watching someone who's in that abusive relationship who really doesn't want to leave or isn't in a place to yet, that can be really hard when you really feel like you have something that, that they could do or take advantage of. So how do we manage our own feelings around how hard this work is so that our feelings don't get in the way of our ability to, to not only support them non-judgmentally, but to also like not start projecting <laughs> our stuff onto them. How do we, how, what are some ways that y'all manage that? For me, it's therapy. Um, you know, I think everybody come, you know, and I know therapy is not for everybody. You know, I personally, you know, found two really amazing black women um, therapists who allow me to be able to do the work that I need to do around my own trauma without, 
um, having to also explain my blackness as a part of that. Um, and, you know, and, you know, it's, it's not, for I'm not doing the work that I'm doing for for myself I'm doing it for other people right and so in those instances and so it's it's important for me to unpack my own stuff in my own biases my own um my own trauma my own lived experiences my own goals and desires and ambitions with someone else and, you know, so that I can learn, I can learn how to, um, to, to be present and to, to consistently give people the help that they are looking for and not the help that I think that they should have. And I think that, you know, for, for many of us unpacking all, you know, our own, our own preconceived ideas of what a good life means um, uh, can allow us to be able to do this work from the space that we intend to do it from and not from a place of our own privilege, whatever that privilege looks like. That actually kind of led us a little bit into our final question before we open it up to Q&A, which is um, kind of thinking about what it could look like you know, like what, what do services look like if we shift to hope and think about how honoring people's agency through harm reduction and radical non-judgment um, could really transform systems and transform individual people's lives? What is it about this approach that gives you hope? What kinds of visionary programs do you imagine if you just wanted to briefly share something that gives you hope in this work? Um, I would like to share that the more that um, our communities focus on decolonizing, I feel like so much inherent harm reduction and healing comes along with that for our communities and even our allies, you know, who might learn from some of our practices and things like that. So that's kind of what I think of when I kind of dream of a better future. Yeah. Um... I want to preface that like I have a lot wrong with me. So some of the things I say are insane <laughs> and I'm going to do my best to <laughs> just kind of trim the fat off of it a little bit. But like right one of the things that we're doing at HIPS right now is um, um, a drug possession decrim decriminalizing all possession of all drugs in addition to our decriminalizing um, sex work completely um, work. Um, and um, I do plan to do this within the next like two, three years. Like I'm like in my brain, there's no question that this is going to happen. And I'm already thinking about the next thing. So that's what gives me hope is like assuming that we'll win. <laughs> um, just be like, yep, that's going to happen. So what happens after sex workers decriminalize? That's like a question that we're always discussing. And one of the things that a lot of the participants here have been mentioning is that thought work, like um, Emmy talked about this and then talked about this, that sex workers and drug users are not really seen as thinkers or people who have perspectives. Um, and I'm in DC and we're like the think tank capital <laughs> of the States. And I'm like, it would be totally dope to have a, like maybe not a think tank in the ways that these people are doing it, but a space for like organic intellectuals where if we thought of lived experience as a credential, if I'm not, I'm not trying to make it sound corny and weird and gross and cold, but lived experience means something. There's a certain amount of knowledge that you have that other people do not have and honestly can't, I don't think they can have. Um, and I think therefore it's important for these people to be thought leaders, like as thinkers. Um, so I have like this whole plan, this image in my head about like having um, organic intellectual um, uh, placements, like fellowships at universities, like across the world where people with lived experience can be a part of that and be funded to think like old school, like um, I forgot what they call it, where you're an artist and there's like a rich family that just pays for you to survive and think and dream and be an artist while you create residency? art. You kind of a residency, but something like a like patronage system, basically, where it's like you have three years to paint this one painting, Michelangelo. Good luck. You got this kind of a vibe. Um, so I want, I want them, I want Lux, I want, not luxurious, but super fulfilling, thriving worlds for sex workers and drug users and people who love them. So that, yeah, that's what gives me hope is knowing that it's possible because I've seen it. I've seen it in different places already, you know. 
Awesome. Um, so I think that, you know, National Survivor Network is it's there. It's just really, to me, exciting. And I, I joined, like, you know, recently because I saw that how it was trying to bridge those gaps and actually give voice to survivors and people who have experience in, you know, in the sex trade, the full range of voices. So that's that's a start. Now we just need like, you know, like, I don't know, on the money <laughs> for it to actually have like those residence, residencies in places or our own think tank. I don't know, our own super pack, whatever. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> which we don't have, but yeah, and I, you know, like I said, I, I'm, I co-founded organization called Eileen's and that's, you know, building with a community and having, you know, we, we recruit from the community to be, you know, for people to be peer leaders and they become the paid staff and people who are actually still connected to the community and they come from in, you know, and that's really exciting. So I'm really excited about that. I also co-founded um, the Massage Parlor Outreach Project, um, like you know, several years ago. And that's like a, working with massage parlor workers. And I'm not deeply involved because I don't speak any of the language that they speak, like Chinese and different, you know, languages. But um, I co-founded it, and and it's actually building the leadership among the massage parlor workers who are migrant Asian workers who are working in those massage parlors, and so all the things are happening, and you know, trying to be trying to amplify the voices of people who are directly involved in those places. Um, and it's really exciting. So. Yeah. Thank you. So I know that we don't have a lot of time for um, Q&A, but I want to really take time to try to answer them. And I do recognize that our attendees and some of our panelists may need to duck out and have a hard stop. So, um, But I am going to try to get through the questions because I'm really grateful for you for being here and for asking this, right? So um, I think I want to start with one just because it might be something as simple as putting a link in the chat. And that is, is there data about harm reduction that can be replicated in helping others, right? So is there research or data already there that we can draw upon to, to try to replicate practices and outcomes? Does anyone know? It's, it's hard to define, you know, for, 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 the, for there to be a data, the study has to define what harm reduction is. It's one thing to say that, you know, like for example, the a needle exchange reduced infection rate. You know, that's data that you can collect. But when you talk about harm reduction as a whole, that's such a huge thing. I don't know how you study that as a whole, right? We can only look at the specific um, tactics and that doesn't really capture the spirit of it, which is uh, like a, you know, radical non-judgment. And that's like more of attitudes and values rather than specific tactic, right? So I think that's the difficulty of of showing the data. Does that make sense? It does. Because it's kind of like harm reduction isn't a, a thing that we do. It's a way that we go about it. It's kind of what I'm getting. Right, right. So yeah. I think I think like you know, like I like I said, like you can you can study the specific tactic and you know see if that's effective in a public health study but i think like we're going by the lives we are actually touching and how people are being you know what people are saying about their experience and how they you know came to eileen's and how that like changed their lives how they, that made it better how they got their child back from the cps how they got you know how they got into treatment that they wanted to get into or, you know how they got the their id and driver's license and now they can drive and things like that that's what we see right not the not the specific you know specific data on the tactic and I know we touched on this a little bit, but I'm seeing um, a question in the Q&A that says it's frustrating when folks teach harm reduction with a hard focus on change and not choice. How do you suggest that we as survivors shift the framework and work with other movements to build power to reframe that narrative to really focus on choice? Do y'all have some concrete tips for shifting that narrative? Yeah, I think that's once again like a difference between the tactic and 
you know, values that people think of like, you know, harm reduction is a better way to change people's behavior is like top down kind of, you know, way that they think of the harm reduction tactics. But the, when you come to the values, it's not, it's not that, right? And when it comes to values that it actually has to respect people's autonomy and choice. And changes can happen if people want changes and often people do want some kind of a change in their lives, whether to, you know, to use it more safely, whether to like reduce their use or have more control over their use and, or maybe like they just want to live longer, right? So changes are often, you know, part of what people want, but not, something that's like pushed on people that's not in the, you know from top down but it's something that comes from people and their own their what they value in their own lives as opposed to what the society wants them to do and i think that and uh, you know that's that's what we've been, been doing i think one way that i'm trying to do it is to talk about you know like i said like 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 i've been saying like you know talking about harm reduction as a value as opposed to simply a tactic and in seattle area Basically, all agencies claim that they are harm reduction based when when they are not, even when they are not, and which means that they don't, they are not absolutists. They don't kick out people from program because they stray away from some goal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they actually support people's autonomy. So I think that the talking about the harm reduction as a value and and the the phrase that you know of the radical non judgment is really I think could be useful in talking about harm reduction so that to make sure that it's not just a tactic but it's being like radically non judgmental. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's it's interesting that you know as you were talking, Emmy, you rem reminded me of something that I I mentioned in another meeting last week about the ways in which the um, these faith based um, you know abortion abortion alternative um, agencies operate where they you know mask as like pregnancy resource centers and then you know the person who's seeking an abortion walks in the door and they're being shown videos of what they're you know, fetus looks like, and they're, you know, given all of this material around adoption and trying to be, they try to, you know, convince them to not have an abortion, but they mask themselves as being, you know, you know, pregnancy resource centers for people who are seeking abortions. And, you know, we, you know, what, whatever in a, in a post row world, which is amazing that we even, that I, we even live in that space now. Um, you know, we recognize that place that that is not acceptable to you know to offer to to lie and tell someone that you are offering them help when really you are trying to convert them to your way of thinking and you know about things that are going to impact the rest of their lives and so if that is not acceptable then why is it acceptable to you know claim that you are there to help survivors and and sex workers if you ultimately are trying to get them to, to do what you want them to do or to claim that you're looking to help substance users, but really you are not looking to help them. You're looking to get them to do what you want them to do. And so, you know, if we if we think about, you know, all, all you know, if we think about harm reduction as as healthcare, if we think of you know harm reduction as mental health care, if we think of it in the same framework that we would think of abortion care or birth control or or anything else, then we then it makes it. I think it it's a reminder that we're thinking about the autonomy of the human being and not just you know outside of a um, a, a, a a moralistic you know, framework. Um, you know, you cannot judge people. You cannot con try to convince people to do what you want them to do based on your personal morals and values, or even the your your numbers and the boxes that you need to check when you get ready to fill out your tax forms at the end of the year, or you know the your your grant reports at the end of the year. Like ultimately, this is really about the individual and their autonomy and their right to self determination. And if that being the case, then you have to take a, a harm reduction, a harm reduction approach, um, and maintain and make sure that harm reduction is at the center of your values, both personally and, you know, organizationally. 
Thank you, Cinnamon. I'm going to I'm going to do one more question. I'm going to take the second half of one of the questions that's in here because I know that it's probably on a lot of folks' minds. Um, NSN members who are here and other survivors. Um, but someone asks, so um, it is my belief that, and this is a, you know, coming from a, an attendee, it's my belief that survivors who have a strong trauma responses to the concept of harm reduction or someone engaging in camming, for example, or whatever, it's my belief that they're responding from a wound, right? Because it can be really hard when your um, only or primary experiences in uh in commercial sex were really, really frightening for you, right? That's a wound. So how do we build understanding between each other when it's so hard for us to access healing in the first place and the sector tends to dictate or indoctrinate um, both workers and survivors with the language and the framework that's normalized in the sector? So what are some ways that you can see that we can both honor that wound and still build partnerships around and, and moving through that wound. I mean, I I think to to to, to when I hear that you know someone may be responding from a wound, it's it's hard for me to wrap my head around that because it may it may or may not be a wound. And if it is, and like, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes, sometimes we have to give people grace for the, you know, their, their, for whatever it is that they're, they're going through. That's not, that doesn't have anything to do with us and taking it, taking that personally um, is, is counter and counterproductive, right? It's like, you know, to assume that someone may be you know, operating from a wound when really they may just be utilizing the options that are available to them also. Um, Can I reframe just because I know the person who asked that question? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank I you. think what they're asking is a lot of times trafficking survivors, you go to get services and they tell you this wasn't your fault. Sex, sex commercial sex is horrible and you've been so abused by it. And they like, dictate to you as a survivor the language that you then use and that means that when you're attending a harm reduction panel and someone says helping people have good pictures or get a website or a platform is harm reduction everything in you bristles because you have your own wound around your your violence in commercial sex and so this is someone asking who supports harm reduction how can we build bridges and support those people who maybe still have like that this concept is really scary for them this concept of harm reduction feels really scary or counterintuitive is that does that kind of help cinnamon okay thank you for clarifying yeah, that's okay <laughs> yeah i think you know i think the radical non-judgment means that you know non-judgment for people regardless of where they are at and that includes the people who are you know very hurt by and their own experiences and it's really difficult and they and they don't have to participate in any kind of harm reduction stuff um, people who you know have used drugs in the past and there are lots of people who just don't want to be near any paraphernalia they shouldn't be you know doing you know exchange because that will be very hard for them because if they're near paraphernalia there's too much like urge or too much you know um trauma from you know, the time that they were using and things like that. And, you know, it's, you know, people shouldn't have to put themselves in that environment, but, you know, but they also shouldn't be telling people to stop doing needle exchange because of their personal, you know, personal suffering with that, you know, it's as a, as a public policy, it's a good, a good idea to do harm, uh, needle exchange. And it it's a good idea to provide harm reduction based services to people um, even though that's not for everybody to do, like it's not, you know, people shouldn't have to do that. And I think that right now, so much of that is that service providers telling people to adapt certain narrative. And actually, like this is like many, many years ago, but I went to this like organization because I needed some help with like, you know, like I actually 
needed lots of resources. So I went to this organization that was supposed to help people who are, you know, who are in sex trade, or at the time they're just calling it prostitute, prostitutes. And and they 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 started saying like, oh, you must have had this experience and this experience and that experience. I'm like, okay, those are true. Yes, yes, yes. And then one time they said, oh, and then you must have this experience. I was like, oh, actually, no, not that part of experience. That's not me. And then this person started saying, oh, that must be that you must be beaten so many times that you just don't remember it because your brain is damaged. And just trying to tell me what my story is. Um, like, I mean, that's kind of extreme, but that's, you know, the version of what happens a lot when you go to those organizations that they assume that they know your experience and you know and then you get positive reinforcement for repeating those and then you get dismissed if you say anything different and as a result like you end up having to take that on as your identity and then that really needs to be avoided right because that's not respecting where people are at that's like pushing your own story to survivors I'm interested. I'm hearing what you just said and what Cinnamon said actually intersect because both of those are like, whether you're doing something from a wound or not, doesn't mean that you get to either invalidate other people's agency and choices um, and force them on them or have your own choices and agency invalidated by someone else, right? Um, like we can each define our own experiences, but that doesn't mean we get to define everyone else's. And I think that that's a, a way to look at it both ways, right? Um, yeah. Well, thank y'all so much, um, panelists. Was there anything else that's just there that you're just dying to get out before we close the Zoom? All right, well, uh, um, thank you to all of you who took your time to be with us here today, to our interpreters for um, helping make sure this webinar is um, accessible. Um, and I would also really love to thank and offer props and flowers and applause to all our panelists who are um, amazing and have come here into a very complicated space at the intersections of anti-trafficking work and sex worker harm reduction for sharing so thoughtfully and with all your insight and your vulnerability. I just, I'm grateful for all of you. All right, thank you so much. <laughs>